All right, we are ready to go. Let's open up the text this morning to Isaiah 52 and 53. I'm going to read from 52.13. Let's just read to verse 3 in chapter 53. And then we're going to pray together with the congregational prayer that's in your bulletin. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Let's pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. One of the Old Testament professors at Westminster Seminary in its earliest days was a man named E.J. Young. And he suggests why this fourth poem, this fourth servant poem, begins the way it does in verse 13. That is, my servant shall act wisely, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Why begin that way? And Young says, As his exaltation and glorification were of the highest, so his degradation will be of the deepest. Our contemplation of the servant's suffering might easily lead us to conclude that they would destroy the servant and that he was justly suffering for his sins. To prevent us from this error, the prophet stresses at the outset the exaltation that will surely come to the servant. Now, E.J. Young doesn't quite have Calvin's flair for writing, but his skill with reading the Old Testament text is evident here. We begin with the exaltation. Now, I'm sure just about everyone here, if not everyone, knows in the back of their minds that we are reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. But continuing my practice, I'm taking a divided approach to this servant poem, as with the others, because I want us to read it as if we knew nothing more about redemptive history, the story of redemption, than those who were its original readers. 
Or maybe anyone who read Isaiah 53, say up until, I don't know, A.D. 22. Because I'm fascinated by it. And how strange this poem must have seemed to them. How mysterious. How totally out of step with their knowledge of their own past it must have sounded. And we'll see that when we see Yahweh's arm in the next sermon. We all know what Yahweh's arm is. That's the Exodus. Power. Strength, authority, divine power. Well, what kind of arm is this? That's the mystery of it. And though we Christians cannot experience their original sense of wonder, or maybe their original sense of absolute bewilderment, we can at least try to hear it with their ears as a way to appreciate even more God's person, that is, His nature and character, and His redeeming work. At the same time, of course, we read the fourth servant poem through the lens of servant's person and redeeming work. And we know servant has a name. His name is Jesus for he has saved his people from their sins. There's nothing wrong with reading it that way. Reading it through the lens of Jesus' death and resurrection. And we'll continue to read it that way. But it's good to pause and remember that God wisely and very graciously gave the information about the servant to his people this way. And so in a sense it's like what Churchill said about Russia. It's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And by doing it this way, and this is important, may not seem important to us now, but in the story this is very important. By doing it this way, God eliminated every and all pretenders to the messianic title. And there were many in the first and second centuries. And you remember the story of the meeting, uh, Acts chapter 5, with Gamaliel, when he says, look, if, if this movement is of God, we can't stop it. And if it isn't of God, it will peter out on its own. But the real litmus test of a Messiah, the one who was entitled to take that title, was suffering and then glory. And God eliminated every and all pretenders to messianic glory by insisting that this would be the sequence of his anointed one. If a Messiah does not suffer before he enters into his glory, he is not God's Messiah. And I can't think of any other place in all the Old Testament where these two states, these states of being, suffering and glory, are welded so close together as they are in our passage. And that brings me to my first point this morning. And I'm calling it Servant's Divine Exaltation. Servant's Divine Exaltation. That is, glory. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Why not just Servant's Exaltation? Glory. Why use the word divine? We know in retrospect that the servant is divine. But I'm thinking of Isaiah 53, verse 10. Right in the middle. He shall see his offspring. 
He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's the servant's divine exaltation. That is, it's God's will to exalt him, to prosper him, to give him glory. Now, as we've seen before, it is one way to tell a story where you give away the ending right at the start. You show the the victory, the celebration, right at the very start of the story, and then you go back to where the actual story gets underway, and then watch as it moves forward to see how did it, how did it get here to this place of victory and celebration. And I think in this sense, chapter 52.13 just keeps up with the spirit, with the whole tone of chapter 52 up until now. Your God has become king again. There's the messenger. He's breaking over the peak of the hill. He's waving a flag, however it is he communicated. And the news is good. God is the king again. And all that stands for Return from exile, renewal of the city, uh, the, the, the son of David being on the throne, and on and on and on. And so at the start of 52.13 in the last servant poem, you can see how all of this seems to be directly connected to the servant's skill as God's chosen and anointed deliverer. That is, he shall act wisely. The verb here for wise suggests not just wisdom, but understanding and keen insight. That is, it it adds up to success. In fact, it is a word that is often used of the men of old, like Joshua or David. That is, men who were considered to be among Israel's greatest leaders and deliverers. And of course, success in the Old Testament doesn't mean just any success. Yeah, this guy is great at picking stocks. It's not like that at all. This is the success that the person who knows and loves and meditates on the Torah experiences. Remember that fame that we used to uh, memorize it in Navigators about how Joshua was to meditate on the law day and night, and then he would have good success. It's that kind of success. Success in the mission that God has called Joshua, or in this case, the servant to. Servant's success means Israel's salvation. But he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the whole earth. And once he has successfully completed that mission, then he shall be high, lifted up, and exalted. It's a great picture. It's the picture of celebration. He's the one that we hoist up on our shoulders and carry off the field at the end of the game. We'll sing songs about him. Like when David returned home from striking down the Philistines. 1 Samuel tells us that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. This is the ancient Near East equivalent to a ticker tape parade. And those of you who are New York Yankee fans know well what this looks like and what it feels like because we experienced it so often. It's the Exodus song. Yahweh is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him 
my father's God, and I will exalt him. It's the word that's used here for the servant's exaltation. Or there's David's song, Yahweh lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted, once again our word, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. Yahweh is the ultimate deliverer and savior, and therefore he enjoys the highest exaltation. He is the subject of the Exodus song and of David's song. But this points us to something rather interesting. I picked up this idea from a fellow named Oswald. Isaiah uses terminology like this four times in his book. Three other occasions, right? Listen for the pattern here. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah 33, 10. Now I will arise, says Yahweh. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. And Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Hmm. The plot thickens. Whenever Isaiah uses words like this, high, lifted up, about human beings, it's always negative. It shows up in the translation, something like haughty or proud, as if you walk around with your nose in the air, exalted in that way. But when he uses this language positively, he uses it of God himself. So that leaves us, it plants a seed. Who is servant that he reaches such lofty heights that God will share his own glory with him? Isaiah is the one who's already told us that God is God, and he will not give his glory to another. And yet, these words of praise go beyond celebrating David's victory over Philistines. They are words of praise that belong to God himself. And just as we begin to ponder that part of the puzzle, Isaiah turns right around and plunges servant into the depths. And that's my second point this morning. Servant's divine humiliation. Servant's divine humiliation. Suffering. As many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. I kept the word divine in the point's title, not just for the symmetry, I don't want you to go out from the morning worship service thinking, huh, I guess God suffers. That's not what I mean by divine humiliation, suffering. 
I'm thinking once again of Isaiah 53, 10. Right before those words of exaltation, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, The prophet says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. <clears throat> Servant suffering is determined directly by God. He is appointed to this. I like how the King James puts it here, it, it, staying a little closer to the original. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Well, the first three servant poems prepared us for this radical downward plunge. At one point in the poem's servant laments, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. But then he stops and reassures himself that God will be faithful to him. We see something of an inner struggle servant experiences. The third poem, of course, contains the severest suffering of the first three. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. So servant has, has adversaries. Adversaries who accuse him of crimes. They say he is guilty. Adversaries who contend against him in his mission. And all through that opposition, servant holds fast to his certain future vindication. And so we're confronted with this puzzling mix, suffering and glory. How can they be held together? But it's not until Isaiah 52, 14, and then everything that comes after that, that we begin to learn just how badly and intensely servant must suffer. Or to be crystal clear about it, how badly and intensely servant must suffer under God's hand. We can begin with his physical suffering. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. The First World War coincided with uh, advances in media technology, motion pictures. That same war was also the catalyst for all sorts of new medical discoveries and breakthroughs, including in the field of plastic surgery. Plastic surgery for them was not something you did cosmetically. It was a way to respond to those horrible, disfiguring battlefield wounds. Noses torn off, bottom jaws torn off, big chunks of the face and skull missing. The kind of ghastly physical wounds that would induce nightmares in children. But I mention the motion pictures because doctors began to film the results of their work, the befores and the afters. And this, this historically valuable work can now be found on the internet. And it's really worth looking at. They also have 
uh, early therapies for what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder, what they called shell shock. And if you ever want to see what a man suffering from that looks like in its most terrible form, you'll find it clinically, but it's there. Spasms and uncontrolled movement, it's, it's terrifying. Now, I don't know if Isaiah has this sort of thing in mind exactly, but I do think he wanted to set off the, the natural revulsion we feel whenever we see God's image bearers so terribly deformed. Astonished may not actually be the right word. Maybe shocked. Maybe appalled. That drawing back. E.J. Young, who I mentioned earlier, he has a different angle on this. He says, this does not mean that he appears to be more disfigured than other men, but that his disfigurement was so great that he no longer even appeared as a man. And so servant, the great messianic deliverer, who shares honors ordinarily reserved exclusively for Yahweh, will shock many. But he won't shock them because of his extraordinary wisdom or his military skills. We're shocked by his bruised face and distorted features or maybe because he no longer even looks like he is human. Perhaps we'd be shocked to see him like those Victorian British were to see the Elephant Man, if you've ever seen the movie. So will the women come out of their cities singing and dancing to meet servant? Will they sing joyful songs to one another and bang their tambourines when they realized how marred his visage is in the King James language. There are no ticker tape parades for baseball teams that wind up in the cellar, as you Kansas Cityans know. In fact, their fans begin to give up and stop attending the ball games. And yet, it is right at this point, in this miserable condition, it's, it's right there that servant sprinkles many nations. He sprinkles many nations. The verb for sprinkle occurs 25, uh, no, 24 times in the Old Testament five times in Numbers, once in Exodus, and not surprisingly, 15 times in Leviticus. And here are four occurrences of the word, and because they're fairly close together, I'm going to read the paragraph. This comes from Leviticus chapter 16, which of course contains the instructions for how to observe Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement. I'll pick up in verse 14. And Aaron shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it, third time, over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the people. 
the people of Israel, and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around and he shall sprinkle, fourth time, some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. Now, if you read all the occurrences of this verb, you'll find out that Moses and Aaron can sprinkle oils. They could even sprinkle that sanctified, clean water. But when you add in this idea of Israel's sins and transgressions, and how that theme also dominates chapter 53, It's unmistakable. Servant sprinkles blood. I have to admit something else. Whenever this verb sprinkle is used, it always includes the liquid that is sprinkled. You sprinkle blood, you sprinkle water, you sprinkle oil, but not here. Here, the servant sprinkles many nations. What happened to the liquid? Twenty-three other times, the liquid is always grammatically the object of sprinkle. Well, I would suggest that we're left to deduce that from the servant's marred appearance. It's the battered, bleeding, and broken servant who sprinkles. In other words, it's servant's blood. Servant acting like a high priest. He dips into his own blood, then with his fingers sprinkles it over the nations. His poems have been leading us right here. Isaiah 49, 6. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And it's in the very next verse in Isaiah 49, that the prophet says, Thus says Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of Yahweh, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. We go from one extreme to the other, back and forth. Servant is a riddle wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma. And if we were honest, we'd probably admit that we are not going to make this our life verse. Even though it says here, kings shall shut their mouths because of him. These are the kings shall see and arise and acknowledge his lordship, it seems. For that which has not been told them, they see. For that which they have not heard, they understand. Is that your life verse, by the way? 
I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I don't know if Paul had life verses. But if he did, he may have chosen the second part of Isaiah 52, 15 to be a life verse for his apostolic vocation. I, I wanted to do this, but time doesn't permit it. But I just want to point you toward Romans chapter 15. Now, Romans 15. Who knows what's in Romans 15, right? We've all been romans out by the time we get to chapter 12. And besides, all the good reformed parts have already been taken care of by the end of chapter 9. But Paul's not done. And in fact, Romans 15 is a crucial part of his letter and actually explains why he even wrote this letter to begin with. And in it, there is an extensive description of his mission to the Gentiles and how that figures into God's surprising larger plan of salvation. And as he describes his work to the Romans, he says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Isaiah, excuse me, Romans 15, 20. Now that would be a, a fantastic banner verse for a missions organization that devoted itself to planting churches where there was absolutely no gospel ministry or church whatsoever. But that's not why Paul used it. Paul says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. It is a quotation of this section of Isaiah, word for word. Why is it my ambition to preach in places where Christ has never been preached? Because Isaiah 15, Isaiah 52, 15 is my life verse. I'm the one who brings Christ to those uh, who have not been told and that which they have not heard so that they may understand it. That little piece of Isaiah 52, 15 defined Paul's missionary work, and really it gives us, in a sense, his inspired commentary on Isaiah 52. Here is this passage buried for centuries so deeply in the Jewish scriptures, describing this indescribable person who by the time of Paul, has become Lord of the nations. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves, because Yahweh was faithful to servant. And so having sprinkled them with his blood, Jesus is now high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it was so much a part of your wisdom to hide our Lord Jesus Christ in plain sight in the writings of the prophets. To describe someone who leaves us so perplexed and puzzled 
that we have no category for him, to do it that way so that you could send your son to fit that category. And it was there all along. Even your promise to bring a knowledge of him to those who weren't seeking it, to bring good news to those who had never heard. This is your grace on display for us to see. And as we chart its development and realize the, the description of our Savior and His suffering, we truly want to exalt Him with our praise, to lift Him up high and sing joyful songs and bang our tambourines and celebrate His redemptive accomplishment. Father, we thank You that we, in a sense, do just that whenever we come to the Lord's table. For here, we are brought near to Jesus in a special way, in the bread and in the wine. We are in a fellowship with Him that focuses so much on His death for us, so that we might be reassured of having been sprinkled ourselves. Father, we receive the bread and the wine with thanksgiving and praise as we come and commune with the one who is high, lifted up, and so greatly exalted, yet comes down to meet with those who are contrite in spirit. Visit us, we pray, in your spirit, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to a place where a body has been broken and blood has been spilt. Maybe we can say, in light of the passage, that we come to the one whose appearance was so marred and disfigured, body and blood, that our instinct is to recoil and, and back away. But when we hear the words associated with his suffering, that in fact it is for us, and not something that he endured for himself, as if he had to pay a penalty for his own sins, then maybe we begin to come near. And we come near to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes whenever we eat and drink here at this table. And so as painful as the elements are in what they represent. They are represented to us for our encouragement to know that sin has been dealt with once and for all by a unique and one-time sacrifice of servant, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, rather than back away, we come near as we sense the love that is represented in the sacrifice. And we receive it all with much thanksgiving and praise. If you are not a Christian and you are not a participant in the life of Christ in the Spirit, then please don't come to this table. We do as a church, want to observe the Lord's Supper in a manner that is fitting to its nature. And the worldliness and the ungodliness of the larger community has no place here within the boundaries of the church. So please don't come to the table this morning. But to the rest of you, to those who are contrite in heart, 
so that the God who dwells on high comes to dwell with those who are meek and lowly. Come, for here is where he meets you. Here is where his smiling and welcoming face is to be found in the bruised and battered face of our Lord Jesus Christ.